In the spring of 1999, I was an undergrad at the University of Kansas studying psychology. On the morning of April 21st, 1999, I walked into the large lecture hall that housed my abnormal psychology class. All of the students, uh, perhaps a couple hundred of us total, we entered the classroom in silence that morning. It was eerily quiet, somber, and solemn. That morning, we were looking to our psych professor to help us understand, to help us make meaning of what had just transpired, to explain why, the day before, two teenaged boys, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, had entered Columbine High School in the neighboring state of Colorado and methodically slaughtered their classmates before finally turning their guns on themselves. I will never forget the Columbine massacre. It shook me to my core, and I know that I wasn't alone. It was a national tragedy, the central topic of conversation for days and weeks. It was a bit like 9-11 before 9-11 ever happened. And now, looking back nearly 20 years later, I'm somewhat shocked at how shocked I was. What I mean to say, nearly two decades later, at least 67 mass shootings later, after the shooting of the Amish school children in Pennsylvania, after the Sikh temple shooting, after Virginia Tech, after Fort Hood, after the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, after Charleston, after Sandy Hook, especially after Sandy Hook, where 20 children ages six and seven were killed. After all of this, I am afraid, not of being shot, though perhaps I should be, but what I mean is I'm afraid that I have simply lost the capacity to care anymore, at least to care like I used to. At Columbine in 1999, we lost 13 young people. At the time, that seemed like such an enormous unacceptable number, and it is. It always should be. But as I stand before you today in 2017, the Columbine massacre doesn't even crack the top 10 list of deadliest U.S. shootings. Three of this country's deadliest modern mass shootings have occurred in just the past 17 months. In June of last year at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, 49 were killed another 50 injured. Six weeks ago, the shooting in Las Vegas left 58 dead with over 500 injured. And of course, just last Sunday in Sutherland, Texas, 25 people were gunned down in a small church, including one unborn baby and several children. For that Texas congregation, for the families of all the victims, including the surviving pastor who lost his 14-year-old daughter. For them, I want to feel the same way I felt for the victims of Columbine. But I don't. I'm disturbed by how undisturbed I am. I'm enraged that I'm no longer enraged. I am heartbroken by my own lack of heartbreak. I try to tell myself that it is actually a brilliantly adaptive aspect of our human psychology that we can respond with so much resiliency to repeated tragedy. When we are exposed to, fatigued by so much trauma, we grow inured to it. We have to because we can't survive for long, at least not healthily, in a constant state of emotional, physical, and spiritual agitation. So I guess it's kind of like a coping mechanism. And while that may be true, 
It doesn't really make me feel better about not feeling worse. It was after last Sunday's shooting in particular that I realized that I myself have now come to respond to these shootings in pretty much the same way that I respond to natural disasters. I feel badly for the victims and survivors. I may donate money to a relief effort after the fact. But I don't worry much about preventing future natural disasters because earthquakes and tornadoes, these things happen. They will happen again. And I can't do anything to stop them from happening again. Mass shootings ought not feel like unavoidable natural disasters. Yet, the problem of gun violence in this country, and specifically the problem of mass shootings, is a problem that is proven to be perniciously resilient. It refuses to be solved. That is because it is not a simple problem. With apologies to William of Ockham, I tend to believe that most of the big problems we face in our lives are incredibly complex. And anyone who tells you that they can be solved with simple solutions is either uninformed or perhaps trying to sell you something. I would actually argue that our national epidemic of mass shootings is what researchers call a wicked problem. Now that term sounds like it might be a theological catchphrase thrown around loosely by pastors, but it's actually a technical term in the field of policymaking and social engineering. The term wicked problem was first applied in this sense in 1967 in a journal called Management Science. So in short, a wicked problem refers to any large-scale problem that is especially resistant to being solved for a variety of complex reasons. Over the years, researchers have enumerated specific characteristics of these so-called wicked problems or derivative concepts. Some of these characteristics include no definitive formulation or agreed upon definitional parameters of the problem itself. It's a lot of words. Another way of understanding that is a wicked problem cannot be fully understood until after it is solved, if it ever gets solved. The wicked problem refuses to solve itself over time, so the harm it causes will not expire naturally. Every wicked problem is novel and unique, so there are few historical precedents to guide us in solving them. Proposed solutions to the wicked problem are neither true nor false, neither right nor wrong. Rather, they represent competing values. And stakeholders in a wicked problem often have radically different values and radically different worldviews, meaning they have completely different frames for even understanding the nature of the problem, let alone agreeing upon potential solutions. Wicked problems are fractal. Every wicked problem can be understood to be a symptom of an even more wicked problem and is itself comprised of other wicked problems. To this last point, uh, if you were here last Sunday, you may recall that Thomas Karst said something similar from this pulpit. So I will use his verbal formulation today as well. Gun violence isn't actually a problem. It is a solution a poor, maladaptive solution to another, deeper problem. Again, that is to say, gun violence is the symptom of a far more wicked problem, or rather, a constellation of wicked problems. I am no social engineer or policy wonk. I am just a simple preacher. But it seems to me that the wicked problem of mass shootings in this country is a nexus where at least five other wicked problems meet. One, we have gun policies in this country that are poorly designed and poorly enforced. Polls indicate that Americans, most Americans, a majority of Americans agree that access to and possession of firearms should be regulated in common sense ways, not unlike the ways that automobiles are regulated. But actually making this happen 
is itself a political wicked problem that involves the Second Amendment, the Supreme Court, the NRA, and a uniquely American culture of conspiracy theories and paranoia. Two, we don't care about mental health in this country. In this country, mental health is stigmatized, underfunded, and too narrowly defined. When we talk about mental health, we tend to almost always exclusively talk about mental illness. We rarely talk about mental health as something that all of us need to be watching for ourselves. We rarely use the term preventative care when talking about mental health, and we need to. Three, this country is infected with a disease called toxic masculinity. At least 95% of mass shootings in this country are carried out by men. Masculine rage is a growing phenomenon that some researchers, researchers believe may be correlated to recent social advances made by women and the LGBTQ community. There has been a slow but steady erosion of male, hetero, cisgender privilege over the past few years. What does that mean? The patriarchy is falling. Men are slowly being dethroned. And so what it once meant to be a man in this country is very much at odds with what it must soon mean if we are to continue marching toward full liberation and equality. And in that gap between what we were and what we are becoming is where we as a nation are failing our boys and young men. We have a generation of young men chasing a ghost called masculinity, and it is leading them over a cliff. Masculinity, being a man, must mean something more than simply perpetuating sexism, misogyny, and rape culture. Four. We have a problem with radical individualism in this country. Now, traditionally speaking, America has always lifted up the needs of the individual over the needs of the community. Collectivism is a four-letter word in these parts. And that fear of community has led modernity on an accelerated trend towards social atomization. More and more people are locking themselves in their homes, trapping themselves in social media and traditional media echo chambers. It has never been easier to live life without ever authentically connecting with another human soul. There are too many lone wolves in this country because we as a people don't value community. We don't understand what the word means. We only understand what it means really to live as a group of individuals. And so it is no surprise that so many in this nation are alienated, lonely, individuals untethered to social norms, expectations, or social morality. And finally, five, we are a culture that glorifies violence. I'd like to someday give a more nuanced analysis of this phenomenon, but for now I will simply note that Americans are, and have always been, a particularly violent people. It is a part of our cultural DNA. So to solve the wicked problem of mass shootings in this country, we only have to convince our legislators and president to pass comprehensive gun safety measures, <laughs> secure universal access to affordable or free comprehensive health care that includes preventative care for mental health, completely redefine what it means to be a man in our society, replace our centuries-old cultural bias for radical individualism with radical community, and agree as a nation to change our attitude about violence, which might include changes to the way violence is depicted in movies, TV, books, and video games. That's it. So you see why it's called a wicked problem and why it might seem more rational to believe that we're more likely to be able to stop an earthquake than stop the next mass shooting that will occur in this country. This problem is so resistant to solutions we can't help but feel powerless. Fighting this fight for so long, many of us have lost our sense of agency and efficacy. 
And because the human heart cannot live long in that kind of pain and despair, some of us have grown apathetic and hopeless as it relates to this issue. Now, this is the point in the sermon when I'm supposed to say, but, and then give you the dramatic turn that will fill us all with hope and inspire us to keep moving forward. It's hard to preach hope when so many have fought so hard and gained so little. Instead of gaining ground, it seems like we're losing it. Instead of getting better, the more we fight, the worse things seem to get. So if there is a hope shot for you this morning, if there is a proposed solution, my proposed solution to the wicked problem, it starts with this. Prayer. Now, if you lean left politically, and if you're on social media especially, you know that the phrase thoughts and prayers, especially when applied by politicians to tragedies like we're talking about this morning, that phrase thoughts and prayers has been derided and vilified by people who are sick and tired of nothing ever changing, who see that phrase thoughts and prayers as nothing more than hollow political tripe, and it probably is. But I also have to say that as a Unitarian Universalist who finds value in our humanist theology, as one who doesn't even really believe in the concept of a personal God, as one who tries to embody the words of our covenant to make service our prayer, I personally don't take the idea of actual prayer lightly. Actual praying, as in like addressing a deity or petitioning a higher power, that is frankly something that I rarely do in my personal life. Often, I only pray when things are really, really, really bad. When all else has failed. When I literally have nothing else to place my hope in. This week, following the Texas shooting, I felt compelled to compose a prayer. A prayer that I don't even necessarily believe will ever be heard or answered by anyone beyond this room. Nevertheless, with your indulgence, I would like to close our service with it. I know that we have tremendous theological diversity in this sanctuary. Some of you pray, some of you don't. If you are a prayer, then I invite you to join with me in a spirit of prayer this morning. And if you are not a prayer, then I invite you to simply listen, to hear these words, and perhaps contemplate how you might bring to life, how you might incarnate the desires expressed within this petition. I ask you to join me. Spirit of life, source of all, God known by many names and none. I come to you for I am in need. I need new eyes to replace the old ones that have grown weary and willfully blind to the suffering of my brothers and sisters and siblings. I need new ears to replace the old ones that have grown tired and willfully deaf to the lamentation of my human family. Most of all, I need a new heart. Back when I still called myself a Christian, I read in the Bible, in the book of Ezekiel, a promise once attributed to you. Allegedly, you said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So I'm calling in that promise today because my heart has grown stone cold and hard with frustration and despair. I need healing. I need to be healed of my apathy so I can keep the promise I once made to you and myself to never cease fighting to make this world a better place. And today, I will make you a deal. If you will forgive me of my inaction, 
If you will forgive me of my sins of omission for failing to do more to stop these senseless tragedies, then I will forgive you of the same, because I think we may be complicit. I need hope, hope that all of this can still change. Yet in the midst of this darkness and despair, I am thankful. I am thankful for this community. Please continue to bind our hearts together, knit our spirits together, so we may better understand what it means to love one another, so that we may become the full living embodiment of the beloved community. And in so doing, perhaps we shall discover that we can become our own kind of wicked problem, an unstoppable, irresistible force for compassion and justice, resistant to being solved because of the power of our interconnections, a force for good that cannot and will not be defeated. May this prayer represent the beginning and not the end of our continued struggle to incarnate love in this world. Amen and blessed be.